This review was made possible by the support of my patrons. Patrons get early access to these reviews and also get their names in the credits, as well as access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server. More details in the description. With Chapter 2, War of the Sontarans, Doctor Who Series 13, otherwise known as Doctor Who Flux, is now well underway. After the events of the last episode, the 13th Doctor, Yaz and Dan are thrown into the heart of Sevastopol during the Crimean War. And not only that, but the Sontarans have used the Flux as an opportunity to rewrite Earth's history and have placed themselves in the heart of the conflict. Yaz and Dan are promptly swept away through time as the Doctor has to team up with War Nurse Mary Seacole and British army forces to defeat the Sontarans. Meanwhile, Dan is returned to 21st century Liverpool and meets up with his parents to beat the Sontarans at the centre of their operations, whilst Swarm and Azure pursue Yaz and Vinda to the planet Time, where the first phase of their plan is put into motion. So lots of plot threads here, and thankfully War of the Sontarans is given a full hour to give each one the attention it deserves. It's also interesting to see how the structure of Doctor Who Flux is changing as the series moves forward. The Halloween Apocalypse is unabashedly a prologue, but War of the Sontarans feels like it started life as a standalone Sontaran story that has been streamlined and turned into an A plot with the additional flux elements with Swarm and the Mori at the Temple of Atropos making up the B plot. Not only does it keep the pace up by cutting back and forth between the different plot threads, giving the episode a sense of momentum, but it also prevents the respective plot lines from getting bogged down in extraneous plot strands in and of themselves. Dan meeting his parents and sneaking into the Liverpool docks is just that, it's a sneaking mission. That's not me trying to undersell the story, but with other Chibnall scripts getting so bogged down with huge casts, branching plots, like how the Timeless Children is just three season finales bolted onto each other, it means that the small cast can actually flourish, and most importantly, they can do it independently of each other. I think that the fam dynamic in series 11 was a real breath of fresh air. After several seasons of the Doctor Companion relationship with the occasional third wheel, having a faux flat team structure worked to change the types of stories that can be told and how they're told for the most part. Series 12 did drop the ball here in my opinion, but with the Doctor, Yaz and Dan separated, it means that we can see what they're made of when they're not relying on each other. I think that's why War of the Sontarans stands out as one of the 13th Doctor's best stories, as she's the only person trying to convince General Logan to not fight against the Sontarans. Her negotiating with the Sontaran, and also leading her to the Invisible Barrier, is what endears Mary Seacole, played here by Sarah Powell, to the Doctor as an expert worth following. With no companions in the picture, the Doctor has to work as the go-between for the Doctress of the Fallen and the egotistical general desperate to appease the Crown. You need my help. I have Queen and Country on my side. That is all the help I need. She here with you now then, the Queen? Obviously not. Then her influence may be limited. Mrs. Seacole, your new assistant is putting me off my task. If the fam were here, or even just Yaz or Dan, it would shift the whole dynamic, but here we have the Doctor on the back foot and trying to overcome this situation. This adversity reminds me of the fifth Doctor during season 19, but without the three companions who can vouch for him, or if necessary, just outnumber the rest of the cast. I actually think that, at least for the A plot, this is War of the Sontarans' secret weapon, along with removing the TARDIS from the equation, as shortly after Yaz and Dan drift away, the Doctor tries to follow them, only for her to arrive at the TARDIS, and the door is missing. I adore this shot of the Doctor following the camera all the way around the TARDIS on the off chance that she's just on the wrong side. It's like a surreal horror moment. It's great. Where's the door? I need the door! That's not to say that it's a perfect way to remove the Doctor's resources from her. For example, as soon as the team arrive in the Crimean battlefield, the Doctor goes to examine a body and sonics it. Is she always like this? Pretty much. Doctor, you're literally a doctor. Why do you need to sonic the corpse? Just put the bloody thing away. 
Anyway, on this battlefield, we meet Mary Seacole, and I think the goal of this episode was to do something similar to Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, by giving the spotlight to someone who is generally underrepresented in media depictions of this time period. It was great to see the British Hotel, a very real sanctuary that Mary Seacole built outside of the battlefields, be depicted in this episode, as well as her no-nonsense, hard-as-nails personality that endeared her so much to the countless soldiers she helped during the the conflict. You just decided to come out here on your own. And if we all of us waited to be sent for, we would none of us find our purpose, would we? I paid for my own passage and I had this place built from what I could find. Proper pioneer. Rice pudding and hard liquor build morale. They also pay for medicines. I also think it's a really great narrative sleight of hand to mention that Mary Seacole on occasion would also help and nurse Russian troops back to health, and working that real life piece of history in with the Sontaran prisoner, Svild, played by Sontaran veteran actor Dan Starkey. We'll talk about the Sontarans in a second, but how brilliant was that moment where the doctor is looking at the world map and her hand and the camera pans over to reveal no Russia, no China, just Sontar. That was so cool. The Sontarans are such a great threat in a series like Flux, because they're threatening and powerful enough to be the main conflict, and they need to be dealt with, but it's also very in character for them to be the opportunists here. They're not the engineers. They snuck onto Earth the moment before the Lupari ships shielded the planet from the Flux, and they're not remotely capable of being the engineers behind it, so they're like a loose cannon type of threat, seizing the opportunity so they can fight some more and place themselves in the heart of Earth-based conflicts. And why Crimea specifically? Well, I think thematically it makes sense. Now, you could argue that most war is pointless, but the Crimean War in particular was especially dumb in retrospect. A conflict started to assert dominance over the remnants of a fallen empire and to lay claim as to who rules over Christians in certain parts of the world. The soldiers were so ill-equipped and the conditions were so harsh that disease killed three times more soldiers than the actual fighting did. The British Charge of the Light Brigade, one of the most embarrassing military defeats in British history, happened because of a game of telephone. It was undignified for for literally everyone involved, throw in the Sontarans, a species that are bred for war, for the sake of war, and Crimea is really fit for purpose here. Also, I wanted to ride a horse. I think that line is the perfect distillation of the Sontarans as a whole, because these are imperialistic potato men who fight for the sake of the fight. It's militarism as religion, with their own dumb code of conduct and cult-like battle cries, and even a weakness that they take pride in so they don't turn their back on their foes. A species that relies more on pure numbers and ideology than effective battle tactics, because being a part of the skirmish itself is the real victory. This mad lad in the Doctor's TARDIS tripping over pool lounges is not upset at his pratfall, he is just happy to be here. But on the other hand, when you think about it, that's actually a bit terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, General Skark, played by Jonathan Watson, wants to ride a horse, but also... I accept your offer of a massacre! Your blood shall soak our uniforms. Your bodies shall soften our steps. That's a chilling line when you forget that it's being said by a Scottish potato. It's also worth mentioning that during this speech, Skark makes reference to Lynx, the first Sontaran who landed on Earth during the Middle Ages in the third Doctor story, The Time Warrior, and he planted his little flag. Apparently, the Sontarans now consider Earth theirs by right now, which is funny, but also a bit terrifying. This planet has defied us ever since the great Commander Lynx first sticked his claim on the ground of its feeble soil. We now assert that claim! I think this tightrope balance of genuine threat, but one that can be pretty ridiculous, is pulled off almost flawlessly here. I especially love Skark's reaction to the Doctor when she outs herself, how he's more surprised about the deception of his underling than some machismo about the gender change. After all, Sontarans don't really understand gender. You deceive my soldier! It wasn't difficult. The girl is not of your kind, Iron Gron. The hair is finer, the thorax of a different construction. 
You have a primary and secondary reproductive cycle. It is an inefficient system. You should change it. Female, number one. First assessment. Would appear to have no military justification. Silence, boy! That's Strax, and as you can see, he's easily confused. Silence, girl! We do have a more comic relief Sontaran with Sfilled, but I think it still works because this guy will kill you if he gets the chance, and also he's clearly just a lowly grunt in the grand scheme of things, though he was still able to survive a cannonball in the back. Oh, I bet that hurt. There is no such thing as pain! A little. When the Doctor makes the offer to parley, if Svild had been a commander or a general, he might have broke rank and killed everyone on his way out of the hotel, but because he respects hierarchy in the military setting, he just angrily leaves to return to base and send the Doctor's message. Yes, yeah, Svild is treated as comic relief, but in an organic way. Now, is this the best Sontaran story in the show's history, or is Skark the best individual Sontaran character? I don't know about that, we may need to sit on this story for a while to see if it holds up, but I think I can safely say here that in War of the Sontarans, we have the best demonstration of the Sontarans as a species in the show's history, as a collective, as a group of villains who take glee in executions or provide swift mercy killings on one of their own, who march into battle with banners carrying the same emblem as was on Field Major Steyer's spaceship from the Sontaran experiment. It's all brilliant, their design is near perfect as well, like a modernised and more polished version of their original 1973 incarnation, with grubby, battle-worn armour with the black and grey colour scheme, they look great. The shot of Skark riding the horse is instantly iconic as well. My only nitpick, you never actually see a Sontaran take off their helmet, and I think that's because the prosthetics are a bit too tall to fit under the domed shape. As rough as the Sontarans looked in the Invasion of Time and even Shakedown, you still got that shot of the helmet being taken off. But once again, it seems like Chris Chibnall has taken a classic villain and just immediately got them right. And that's not to say that the new villains are slouching either, but we'll get to them shortly. It's also a pretty consistent Chibnall strength to have Jodie Whittaker do her best work when she's alone and encountering villains. Seriously, it's a pattern so clear, you can basically draw a line under it, from the Doctor and Cresco, or Tim Shaw, or the Dalek, or a Shad, but because the 13th Doctor is away from her companions throughout this entire episode, I think it allows Jodie Whittaker to really properly shine in what could be her best performance so far as the Doctor. The potential has always been there, and occasionally peering over the surface through no fault of her own. And it's disheartening to see it happen so late in her run, but it feels like her Doctor, consistently throughout an entire episode, is finally arriving. Put it back on. Let's move to Liverpool 2021 with Dan Lewis arriving, meeting up with his parents and then attempting to infiltrate the Sontaran timeships with a walk. I can imagine some people having issue with a companion who just so casually goes along with this idea only in his second episode, but you know what? That's what I love about Dan so far. He takes a walk and just gets on with it because he's from the North and we just get on with stuff like that. I actually think this might be why the revived series of Doctor Who relies on companions coming from London so much because the plot would be over in a few minutes if they came from anywhere else. Oh, fell in Baconhead. He was drunk with a mallet. Baconhead. I'm also struggling to think of anyone else who could have played this role. Obviously, John Bishop has toned down his comedic persona, but when he has to deliver the jokes, he does nail them. They've took over Liverpool docks. They're building spaceships, hundreds of them all along the Mersey. They're not just in the Crimea. And we've got this obsession with Japanese food. Heard one of the chief potato heads talking about tempora command, tempora offensive. What's that all about? Could it, could it have been temporal command? Temporal is in time. Oh yeah, that makes more sense. My favourite joke, however, is when his and the Doctor's video call is rumbled and a Sontaran discovers him. All right, mate, I'm a little bit lost. I I was just looking for the period. And this setup line against the Sontarans worked so well that when more of them showed up, 
he used it again. Alright lads, I was just looking for the period. I can imagine some people cringing at the dad jokes, but maybe it's my age showing. But I know that this would be me if I was in this situation. 100%, no ambiguity. How would you like that, eh? Pan fried Santorin. Now I'm gonna walk right out of here. Not all of the humour works, though. Like when the Carvinista shows up and they have this exchange. What is that useless weapon you got? It's a walk. You look ridiculous. Don't respond, don't respond, don't respond, don't respond, don't respond. There's a bloke with the floppy ears. Damn it! Ah, well. Easy come, easy go. Anyway, while I loved seeing Carvinista back, We'll talk about him in a minute when I talk about my issues with this episode. I do love how the shots of Dan with the Wok are filmed like these epic hero moments. Chibnall has always been good at blending the fantastical with reality, and this fits right in here as well. I think that it was a bit strange for Dan's parents to make their full first appearance here though. Maybe they could have had a scene in the Halloween apocalypse, even if it was just a phone call or a video call, just something to establish that they existed. But it's not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things. But that reminds me, last week I took issue with the Joseph Williamson segments because they didn't really serve any immediate purpose, and the callback at the end of the episode felt really out of place. But while I stand by that original criticism, I think it might have been worth its inclusion just to make his brief appearance here or the stranger. He's just wandering around the Temple of Atropos, wondering what's going on, and the anachronistic Victorian guy who has definitely seen some crazy stuff is trying to suss out Yasmin Khan, who finds herself here along with Vinda. We still don't know much about Vinda, but I did like him here, trying to figure out the situation with this nagging little triangle bossing him about. Fun fact, the priest triangle are voiced by Nigel Richard Lambert, who played Hardin in the season 18 story, The Leisure Hive. I loved what he brought to the role, this short-tempered shape who barks instructions in what should be a really dignified and grandiose setting. The exposition he gets across is really interesting as well. How is time evil? Vinda says it's impossible for them to be in the Temple of Atropos, but he gets interrupted before he can elaborate. Swarm says that Vinda is looking for redemption, but what has he done? I'm actually starting to get really interested in the law being set up here. And with this subplot, I'm getting the Battle of Ranskor Avkolos vibes, but in a good way. That story was trying to deal with big idea concepts, like a planet that alters the inhabitants' perception, the Ux and their religion, and their status as a duo species. Really interesting ideas, but glossed over due to the immediate stakes and, to be frank, really poor characterization. But here, because this mythology is being passed out over a longer period of time, it feels like Chibnall's vision of truly alien concepts and a complex mythology is finally playing out to its potential. Obviously, it can fall apart at any moment, but things like the Mori and the Ravagers, consisting of Swarm, Azure, and the brand new Passenger, have really got got me interested. But let's talk about the real strength of this subplot, and it is this trio. We've got the massive Chad sidekick Passenger, who could be Diane? I mean, Passenger comes out of nowhere, and she was the last person to be seen with Swarm and Azure before they arrived on the planet of time. But questions for later. Their existence in War of the Sontarans contrasts so well with the fun Sontaran threat on Earth, with their valor system, their fun anachronisms, and obvious weakness at the back of the neck standard Doctor Who stuff, but then all of a sudden these SOBs show up, like from an entirely different franchise, like Doctor Who has just crossed over with Hellraiser, and these folks not only relish in death and chaos, but they can inflict it with a touch. Azure seems to get real enjoyment out of their powers, whereas maybe Swarm sees what they're doing as a duty. It's a great dynamic. I love how nonchalant Swarm is as he poses in the background, knowing full well he could easily tear anyone else in this room room apart. They feel like they don't belong in this franchise, and that discomfort manifests in how he treats the Doctor and her companions, just grabbing Yaz by the face to threaten her. That's something that Doctor Who villains, they just don't do. Well, unless you're that security guard from Bad Wolf. Just leave him alone. I'm asking him. 
He knows everything about Yaz, who just a week ago, I got the sense was just wanting adventures and exploration in space, and for a few minutes, she got it with Vinda. And then these guys show up, and it just shows how out of her depth she is. Sam Spruill and Rashenda Sandal are so good here, and that makeup work is so consistently impressive. Providing nothing drastically undercuts them in the next few episodes, we could be dealing with some of the best original villains of the revival. Maybe since the 70s, we'll have to see. Now, before we get to that cliffhanger, we need to talk about some of the issues with this episode, because I do have some here. Now, I actually think that the characterization, the pacing, the threat, the stakes are spot on. However, some of the plot specifics really hurt the credibility here. For example, you've got Svild in custody at the British Hotel for at least several days. That's how Mary Seacole was able to recognize the consistent rest pattern, which ties into the plan Project Crimean Eviction. And, ah, oh, the Doctor even drew a little Sontaran for the board plan, ah. Oh. Anyway, uh, yeah, so it's a really cool detail that the Sontarans can go 27 hours before needing rest, but then it turns out that the Doctor's plan revolves around removing the Sontaran supplies so they can't refuel during their seven and a half minute rest break. But we already know that the Sontarans can survive longer in Earth's atmosphere for several days, in fact, because Svild was able to without being anywhere near a ship. He was in the British Hotel. And maybe you could argue they can survive beyond the 27 hours as long as they're in their suits with their helmets. But Svild leaves the British Hotel without a helmet. The ticking clock that instigates the need for the Doctor's plan is that the Sontarans plan to attack at dawn. They'll attack again at first light. But if the Sontarans can last several days, maybe not at peak efficiency, but can still be relatively healthy, why not just destroy the weakened British army at dawn and then make the strategic withdrawal? I actually think there is a way around this. Maybe have General Logan not tell the Doctor that they'll attack in the morning, he just tells his soldiers. So the Doctor's plan notably is not enough forcing Logan to use the gunpowder behind the Doctor's back with his men. Or maybe while the Doctor and Mary are leaking out the supplies, General Logan and his men destroy their ammunition stockpiles or something like that. Now, this may seem like a nitpick, but when the Doctor was laying out her project, when they mentioned that 27 hour cycle, I almost had a mental whiplash. It really took me out of the story. I do like that ending though, and the sheer horror in the Doctor's voice when she exclaims that the Sontarans were retreating. But because the episode has to get to the cliffhanger on time, pun intended, then it's a moment that really felt glossed over. It felt like an epilogue was required but could not be included because of the serialized format. I don't even mind the Sontarans not having much of a lookout during their rest period or when they're out in battle because, well, they're in 19th century Sevastopol. They don't even expect the humans to get anywhere near their hiding place, let alone in their ships. This makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense, though, is the Lupari's presence. Now, part of this is due to the solution of the cliffhanger being deliberately vague. In November 2021 Liverpool, are the Lupari still there shielding the Earth? Does the flux surround them, or did it just pass them by? If the Lupari are species bonded to the human race, then why is Carvinista the only Lupari sent to stop the sun? Tarans. You could argue that it's because Dan was about to be killed, so that's why Carvanista came specifically. But what about these humans who were executed? There's 7 billion Lupari who were in Earth's orbit two days ago. But these folks, oh, I guess that they don't get a Dogman rescue. Now, it's not a deal breaker because of how fast the episode moves and just how fun and enjoyable the characters were. And I've got to admit, I did love seeing Carvanista come to the rescue and help Dan defeat the Sontarans. Also, I did see some people take issue with the casting of Dan's parents. How John Bishop is 54, but his father, played by Paul Broughton, and his mother, played by Sue Jenkins, are 64 and 63, respectively. Now, there is absolutely an issue with ageism in the TV industry, and how these roles are cast way younger than ideal. It's even got a name, the Aunt May Effect. But I cut them some slack here, kind of, because this series was filmed during a pandemic which disproportionately affected older age brackets, so maybe they couldn't cast older for insurance and safety reasons. Also, we don't have a confirmed age for Dan. He could be in his 40s. Paul Broughton was born in 1957, but his character says he was Wallace's junior boxing champion in 1966. So nine years old? 
Junior boxing is typically 16, so add on seven years? I don't know, maybe he was a nine-year-old boxing champion. This is Liverpool, after all. Anyway, speaking of filming this series during a pandemic, I'm genuinely amazed at how well this episode has come together in a production sense. Incredible moments, great location work, set design, makeup, epic battles that we've never seen before in Doctor Who. This one shot of the Sontarans investigating the dock, then has the camera turn around to face the incoming Sontaran ship. We see Dan and Carver needs to get ejected from it, and then it crashes into the docks in a single take. It's so proficient. As is the long epic pans out of the Merseyside dock as Dan climbs up the ladder, or the scene where the Doctor and Skark face off on the misty battlefield. The Doctor at the top of the hill to send out the parlay signal, the creepy black and white Long Barrow house in the dream sequence, Jamie Magnus Stone has really outdone himself here as director. I'm genuinely prepared to place this episode on the pedestal as one of the best directed episodes of the revival, right next to stories like Dalek, The Waters of Mars, Heaven Sent, and the ghost monument it's that good all done during covid restrictions yet you never get the sense of a compromised production there's still supporting artists around there's still lots of locations and different creatures interacting it looks like business as usual but still firing on all cylinders and it doesn't neglect the characters either this is not just a blockbuster epic production story it feels good, the emotions ring true. Even little moments like when Dan accepts the doctor's offer to come with her. I have to find my friend. You wanna come? Okay. That's such a lovely delivery. He's overjoyed, but he doesn't want to overdo the gratitude. It's so sweet. But that sweetness is short-lived, as the TARDIS, which is being corrupted like no one's business, is hijacked, and the Doctor and Dan are swept away to the planet of time, to witness Yaz and Vinda become placeholders for the dead Mori, and Swarm threatening to reactivate the temple, ripping the Doctor's companion apart. It's a pretty awesome cliffhanger, as the Doctor is helpless against this overwhelming threat. Swarm and Azure really do seem to be in a completely different league to what the Doctor has faced before. Think about it, we've had had Blue Teeth Man, Giant Spiders, The Pating, A Reactionary, The Scorpion Queen, Tree Lady, and Jeff Bezos. Yeah, you've got your huge villains capable of mass destruction like the Cybermen, the Daleks, and the Master, but this feels something more existential. It feels like they're playing an entirely different game to what the Doctor and Yaz have been playing before, and I can't wait to see this explored moving forward. But with War of the Sontarans, I really really liked it. Yeah, it's got some big narrative holes, but it stays standing strong because of its effective characterization, stellar production work, insanely good villains across the board, and a real sense of fun and excitement balanced with the ability to shift the stakes into something more serious and dangerous when required. I think due to there being bigger fish to fry once the Sontarans are dealt with means that Mary Seacole and General Logan get hurried out of the story, and while Seacole is well implemented here, it does feel like a step down from Nikola Tesla or Rosa Parks, though it's a marked improvement over inclusions like Ada Lovelace and Norton Ayat Khan. Hello, dear. <laughs> I don't understand any of this. Jodie Whittaker is superb here. The cliffhanger is gripping. This might be the best Chibnall script he's delivered for the program. It's an epic, action-packed romp across history that feels distinctly like his style is finally clicking into place. Though, to be fair, he kind of won me over early on with Sontarans on horseback, but... That's just me making my biases known. But anyway, join me next week, where time starts to run wild. Weeping Angels, Stork Yasmin Khan, and the 13th Doctor has got a new jacket. All of this and more, next time in Once Upon Time. Hey folks, thank you so much for watching my review of Doctor Who Flux War of the Sontarans. Now first things first, uh, if you're watching this around the time that this video goes up, on November 23rd, 2021, Doctor Who's 58th birthday, I will be doing a 12-hour live stream to raise hopefully more than £1,963 for the film and TV charity. So mark your calendars, details incoming, we're going to have a raffle, we're going to have guests, we're going to have all that great stuff for the charity live stream over the course of 12 hours. Be sure to check it out on November 23rd. And one good way to be notified of when I do that live stream 
is to make sure you're subscribed. Be sure to subscribe to this channel, especially if you enjoyed this review and if you want to help support my work. You can also hit that like button. It really, really helps me out. And also leave any comment down below. Let me know what you thought of the episode. What's your favorite Sontaran story? Basically anything. Let's just appease that YouTube algorithm and start a conversation. I also want to give a shout out to my patrons who help to keep the lights on here. I massively appreciate all of your support. You should be seeing their names uh, coming down the screen right now. And I want to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Ann Neubauer, Andrew, Dean Jones, Andrew Blewett, Berger Magnuson, Callum Baird, Daniel Davis, Dylan Whitaker, Flabu, Flipmeister MK, Jeremy K. Duncan, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Nate Harris, Palex, Raven Woods, The Brit Sniper, Toby Loxton, Zachary Taylor, aka Mario Fanboy 15, Dan Morrison, Nathaniel Holden, Samuel Brooks, Zarby555, Aaron Carver, Adam Gratton, Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, George is Lost, Ginger Animator, Harvey Smith, Jack D. Evans, Joseph Adams, Kean Hartley, Rebecca Hill, Ricky Temple, Ryan Duncan, Ryan Hindley, and Samuel Whitaker. Thanks so much to all of those patrons. Thank you so much to all of you for helping to keep the lights on here and to keep this whole operation going. Uh, if you want to become a patron, links are in the description below. You get these reviews several days early. You get your name in the credits and also access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server. Thanks once again for watching, and I'll see you folks next time.